um, storytelling spaces, places, and the visitor economy. I'm delighted to host this panel, which takes me back to my roots. I actually started in a department that combined tourism and the creative industries all into one. So I'm really delighted to be part of this panel, which will be uh, handle in the style of lightning talks, so short talks, which combine international as well as local perspectives on uh, our theme. And it combines presenters from our uh, departments of creative industries and also the Oxford School of Hospitality Management. And they'll be looking at uh, literary festivals, film, heritage, as well as history. So our first uh, panelist will be Dr. Hannah Klein Thomas. She's a research fellow with the Creative Industries and Innovation Network at Oxford Brooks. And her research is uh, focused on carnival and also digitization. And she works uh, as part of this research with members of the Afro-Caribbean uh, community and Windrush community right here in Oxford. So I welcome uh, to the stage, Hannah Klein Thomas. Right, I hope I get this uh, right with the mic. Thank you for the introduction, Nicole, and let me get uh, started with the lightning talk. I hope I will keep to my time. I find myself at the moment in a peculiar situation. Wherever I go in Oxford and whoever I talk to uh, about my research, people highlight and mention how sad it makes them that Cowley Road Carnival is not taking place this year. Uh, usually they emphasize how uh, it brings people together, um, how it is a creative space for everyone. Um, and as we know, many cultural events in Oxford, um, this, is, this is just not the case. So what I'm going to try to do, oh, just got a little echo there. Um, what I'm going to try, uh, try now uh, is bring my perspective um, and my approach to Carnival um, and discuss Cowley Road Carnival, which only plays a minor role in my actual research on digitalization. But I think it's um, important to kind of see what potential could be unlocked um, with Carnival, how um, stories and histories of Oxford could be told, and especially to an audience that is not the um, white middle class uh, consumer spectator that is usually addressed by default. Right. Um, this narrative of diversity, Carnival as a celebra celebration of diversity, is obviously not unique uh, to Oxford. All across the country, Carnival is discussed in this way um, by policymakers, funding bodies, but also by Carnival organizers themselves. This uh, does not mean that the experience itself of Carnival um, uh, complies with that. Um, the socio political and um, uh, social divisions are reflected in how carnival is organized, um, the ways of engagement and uh, ways of participation. It is also reflected in how the history of uh, carnival in Oxford is told. I'll just give you an example. Uh, one of my colleagues um, who did an oral, uh, oral history interview in, in London with a pioneer and veteran of the steel pan movement um, reported that he was talking about pan men in the 1950s who would talk about coming to Oxford for the summer ball of the university, which I believe takes place this week or last week. Um, and the Trinidadian band would be the last one to perform. And after the act, they would move out into the streets with their steel drums. And um, for everyone uh, familiar with carnival, this is conjures up an image of claiming the streets um, uh, of uh, the road, which is the centerpiece of Caribbean Carnival. So with Rindrush Day, just around the corner, actually, uh, with celebrations have already started and tomorrow being the yearly celebration, it is important to uh, highlight and be very clear um, about how these histories um, are marginalized. Because also this narrative might be uh, not well documented, but also when we look at those that are in community archives where there have been efforts of showing how Cowley Road Carnival actually or, uh, got its origin in Caribbean and West Indian parades in the Oxford city center, uh, starting from the 1970s. And you can see pictures here, kindly um, uh, got the permission of Juni James to uh, project these here today. So there is this documentation and still there's very little knowledge uh, how this originates in uh, traditions of Caribbean Carnival. 
So I think uh, it is very important to recenter the narrative of carnival in Oxford. And I think this is only possible by understanding how raciality and coloniality continues to constitute the creative industries. And that is not in terms of the historical legacies, but actually uh, the present day. Um, I think carnival across the UK is actually a good uh, um, uh, example or prime example how this continues to happen. We have uh, masqueraders, uh, steel pan bands performing for the Queen's Jubilee um, parade. Um, we have Notting Hill partnering with Glastonbury, Cambridge, um, performing at Pride uh, in London. And still the acknowledgement of how much uh, carnival arts have impacted uh, design, uh, performance, um, music, um, fashion uh, in, in all culture, in, in, in the entire cultural arena is still very much uncredited. We're not even talking about compensation. Um, this is even more so the case when we think of the um, benefits on a social level when it comes to community cohesion, mental health, well-being, uh, skills development. We heard a lot about uh, skills development. Why is Carnival such an inviting setting to try out and explore um, uh, different talents and skills that then could lead to a career in the creative industries? So let's have a look into the potential for storytelling. Um, and I'm talking here about uh, Caribbean carnival traditions, mainly looking at the context of uh, Trinidad, also because Trinidadian carnival, this model has served for many uh, organizers in the UK as a model uh, that they have adapted to. Um, it is situated in uh, the, the history and the experience of the Black Atlantic, the Middle Passage. Um, we can describe it as a massive street theater. And one of the main elements obviously being that the audience is not just a passive on looker spectator position, but rather uh, co-constituting the meaning of the performance. Um, and it's very much um, the, the possibility to express subjectivity, to redefine uh, the sense of community and self, particularly for uh, those who this is denied to uh, in the larger sociocultural uh, context. So um, looking at uh, masquerade as one of the core uh, cultural um, and, and artistic traditions, uh, we can see it is a performative visual storytelling. Uh, mask characters, traditional mask characters, are codified history. I just uh, have some examples here, the Dame Lorraine here, um, where the costume is fashioned in the style of the planter's wife. And uh, skits and sketches that would be performed uh, with this character usually ridicule deformities, the excessiveness of the lifestyle of the French Creole, French Creole elite. Um, uh, we have uh, Black Indian Mass, uh, which tells the story of Maronash and uh, the collaboration of um, African um, and indigenous people in the face of colonial horrors. We have Bat Mass, and I chose this one um, because it's kind of referring to a public health crisis, a bit different one than probably the one we experience, but it shows how this becomes inscribed into traditional mass characters. This was um, Michael LaRose's um, take on with a uh, theorist and archivist and one of the uh, people working on carnival in the UK um, with a massive repertoire and archive. And um, what he was uh, highlighting is that in the 1920s, there was this rabies outbreak in Trinidad. Uh, people were afraid to participate in carnival activities. Stories were kind of merged with uh, local um, the folk tales of the Sequoia, the blood sucking um, uh, character. So by having this bat as the, the signifier for, for the, the crisis that was experienced as livestock was affected and um, this uh, crisis broke loose, you would still have the performance of this mask character in Trinidad during Carnival right now. Obviously, when it comes to traditional uh, and, and old masks, it's very much marginalized in contemporary Caribbean Carnival all across the world. Um, but we have this form of embodied remembering also in pretty masks. Um, which is uh, bikini and beats, as it's very often called, or even spectators and onlookers would have this, this interaction and engagement with collective memories, but also individual experiences. And space is essential to this, um, how urban space is experienced and this very extraordinary space of carnival then. 
Um, and I think that is where uh, storytelling um, is an interesting, uh, um, uh, where this perspective on storytelling is quite interesting. Tola de Biri, for example, in her piece on carnival as intangible heritage, makes, uh, talks about the ripples of mass. So not everyone is familiar with these quotes. Not everyone has to be, but everyone is coming together and playing their part in making this possible. Um, and I'm mentioning Tola as well, because next week uh, she's going to be at our Carnival Arts Conference here in Oxford, as is um, Emily Sobel Marshall, who uh, wrote together with Paris on masquerade and also its political potential in the UK. So um, my last point will be on how this framing of diversity has also hindered very much the development of this form of storytelling in the Oxford context and Cowley Row Carnival. Um, because it is linked to commodification, because we have it incorporated in this uh, um, very much neoliberal cultural uh, order. So what happens is if community organizers, um, some of them we, we have today in the audience, just highlighting uh, youth and dailies, for example, contributions, educational resources on traditional mass characters that were made available, uh, but also, um, um, when it comes to uh, mass um, designers being invited and so on. This did not, um, uh, or, or was very much hindered by having this narrative of diversity, ironically. And um, in the field of uh, creative industries, uh, studies, people working on race, therefore make this case at the moment against diversity. Um, saying that diversity in this context of commodification is very much part of how um, the technology um, of, of racialization of, 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 of uh, racialization works. So just an example of my own research in digitalization, we have these uh, wonderful programs, virtual uh, programs that have been put together by uh, carnival organizers. Notting Hill was very much featured as uh, this progressive pioneering um, festival in um, having the Access All Areas program, partnering with Samsung, partnering with Spotify, um, but also prioritizing education for the wider public, um, as well as um, uh, archiving, for example. But at the same time, what I'm looking at is also how the larger context, um, be it um, platform architecture um, and al algorithmic cultures, kind of limit uh, that breadth that is represented in carnival arts and narrows it down to an image that has been commodified and, um, 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 and becomes perpetuated again and again. And this is very much related to the objectified uh, female body, but also when we talk about masquerade as uh, the uh, black male body that is then uh, part of this able-bodied young bodies and that is uh, being um, commodified. Right, so I will end there. I will just um, highlight that next week we have the Carnival Arts Conference uh, happening. For those of you who want to join this conversation, where can Carnival go in Oxford? Um, but also how can we reframe this narrative, um, recenter the narrative? Please do feel invited, um, get in touch um, and um, express your interest. We will be really happy uh, to have you there. Um, what um, I'm also currently doing, apart from my research on uh, digital practices, is uh, looking into diversifying creative spaces in Oxford. I started a project with my colleague Rachel Barbaresi here at Oxford Brooks, and we are mapping uh, creative, diverse creative spaces, but also initiatives to diversify creative spaces. We're working together, uh, as you mentioned at the very beginning, with members of the Oxford Windrush Group, um, and um, try to um, establish a map here that can be, that is grounded in the lift experience rather than looking at this location and following the map as a very colonial construct. And we hope that this will develop further um, in a project that we are uh, gonna start in, in autumn in collaboration with researchers at the University of Oxford and Torch. So we're very much looking forward to that. And I'll end here and hand over to the next presenter. So thank you very much, Hannah, for that wonderful uh, presentation, which shows how storytelling can highlight perhaps some of the more un 
no narratives of Oxford, you know, around race, around uh, diversity issues, around controversial issues. So with that, we go to our next presenter, Dr. Brianna Wyatt. She's a senior lecturer here at Oxford Brooks, and she's specializing in actually dark tourism. We have a lot of examples of these here in Oxford, so I think it's an exciting uh, focus. And uh, Brianna is particularly concerned with interpretation and reenactment of dark histories. So I hand you over to Brianna. For anyone who wants to uh, tweet or uh, tell others about uh, this conference, I invite you or this set of presentations to use our hashtag OCIS2022. So don't forget about that. So to uh, Brianna. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, as Nicole said, my name is Brianna Wyatt. Um, I'm a senior lecturer here. Um, and actually starting in January, I'll be leading our first art tourism module. So all of the stuff you guys are gonna be learning, our students are gonna be learning it as of September, um, sorry, January. So reenacting dark history, reenactment is a form of interpretation, which um, is a, um, a practice, a process, a um, activity, depending on what lens you're looking at interpretation from. And it's used within the event sector, the tourism sector, hospitality, basically any customer facing experience because it is about experience. Within the tourism industry, it is about delivering information to audiences, but not just delivering information, but helping them to appreciate what the information is about so that they go away and wanna learn more. Reenactment is a way that we can do this and not just about heritage, not just about natural history, not just about um, um, you know, non-dark history, but my specialty is looking at how we can use a reenactment for dark history storytelling. It does help to create these experiences within tourism attractions and festivals and events. Even in hospitality sector, it's growing more now um, to use reenactment as a way to create more memorable experiences, a way to give a voice to marginalized groups, a way to give a voice to everyday people that get often overlooked by historians and history makers. If we think about the text, Many of our texts in history are based on historical figures that have done some great thing in history or maybe some not so great thing in history, but we forget about the everyday people and that's where reenactment can help bring those voices to life. Now, there are some myths about reenactment, particularly within the realm of dark tourism, that dark tourism is travel to places associated with death, tragedy and the scene in the macabre, but it is said that dark tourism and reenactments of dark histories mocks the history, or it creates um, a Disney effect, or it's just entertainment. And I argue it's just another form of interpretation. And the way that our world is traveling now, um, more media driven, it is something we should be seeing more and more as, as, as we go forward into the future. These are some examples of actual locations that use reenactment to reinterpret uh, their dark history. So um, it ex uh, exists on a global scale. These are some examples of how it exists. So we have stage performances, we have guided ticketed tours, um, we have um, static exhibits, we have regular tours that um, go on. You also have it in co-created tours where the audience participates as actual members of the reenactment scene. You also see it of course in media with film, television, and then gaming. And again, here are some examples of real reenactments that take place at heritage locations or visitor attractions um, all around the world. In designing reenactments, so this is a crash course uh, for designing a reenactment of dark history within a visitor attraction. This relies heavily on the creative industries. It could not be possible without the creative industries because for example, at the Edinburgh Dungeons where I used to be a duty manager, so I know all about how these experiences are created. Um, they use aroma scent um, props. So for example, at the Real Mary King's Close in Edinburgh, in the playroom, they had a bucket and within the bucket, they had a vomit smell that was being emitted. It was so realistic, this reenactment, that visitors were getting sick on the tour. So they had to take the smell pot out and just explain what suffering from the plague was like. 
but we need props like this within the reenactment scene so that visitors can understand and in a sense step back in time to realize what these people in the past really suffered from and really experienced. Otherwise, it's just information that often goes in one ear and out the other. We need to create almost a visceral response for them so that we're provoking their interest, not just um, creating an experience that they are purchasing. So we have sets, props, and stage design. We also have within reenactment dramaturgy, we need training so that goes in line with theater and getting the theater involved so that uh, the actors who are portraying these histories and portraying real people from history know how to do it in a sensitive way. Even in satirical experiences, so my PhD research, I looked at these type of experiences where there's satire and, and jokes and trivial, trivialization, it's all grounded in actual history. They all did real research to make sure that what they're telling is correct. And so within that, there is a sense of, sen uh, there is a sense of sensitivity that's needed within that. Here's some examples of reenactment at permanent attractions all around the world. So we have um, Edinburgh, the USA. This is one that I find really, really interesting, um, Follow the North Star, because it is a reenactment experience of the Underground Railroad where the audience actually take on um, the uh, form of um, slaves seeking freedom in the North. They are invited by uh, freedom uh, helpers, the Quakers, as well as bounty hunters who are trying to catch them. And then afterwards, they have a debrief where they can talk to historians and really understand what it was that they experienced. So not only is the reenactment an experiential experience, but it is a learning experience, one that they can um, question their own understanding about this history and hopefully make a better future after they leave um, the experience. This is um, not new, but something that's really um, changing the game of the way that museums are taking on history is using interactive gaming. Um, so audience members can literally change the way that Battle of Bannockburn uh, occurred depending on who wins in the game. So these are different experiences at permanent attractions. Here are some examples of mobile attractions. So bus tours, train tours, walking tours. Um, these are different types of reenactments that are occurring. So the 1914 Rise of the Rebels bus tour in Dublin, this is a bus tour company that perform on a moving bus all about the history. And then they take people around um, the city of Dublin to the places relevant within that particular history. They also do the Gravedigger Ghost Bus Tour, which is all about the plague and different supernatural stories within Dublin. That was one of my case studies for my research as well. Um, so there's also static reenactment. So static reenactment, you're probably going, there's no reenactment. Well, it can be reenacted just through uh, dummies and mannequins, as well as set design. You're reenacting information from history in an interpretive way. So um, in the uh, Salem Wax Museum, um, you have witch persecution, sick to death museum, which is another one of my case studies in Chester. Um, they have uh, several different types of reenactment there, including a burial, um, a burial process. So the important thing to remember in all of this is that it aims to create a memorable, unique experience in an experiential way, which is what the theme of a lot of this that we're talking about um, surrounds. So why are there so many reenactments going on? I've showed you a lot of different cases from all around the globe, um, mostly because society is really starting to experience the world through media. And so we need some form of experiential um, opportunities to feel things are real, to really experience things for ourselves. Um, also, there's this um, new thing that's being discussed is cultural distance, not just temporal distance, but now cultural distance and how we perceive darker histories based on who we are, based on uh, what our cultures are. We also are, have become largely desensitized to dark history, mainly because of film, television, and uh, gaming. And then we have advancements in technology. So uh, audiences are now expecting things to be more visceral, to be more live, to really immerse themselves into the experience. So 
just a real quick cap on why this is controversial. I've already said a few of those at the start of this lecture. Lecture, sorry. I used to teach in this uh, uh, room last semester, so I feel like you guys are my students right now. Um, but they are said to have no educational value. They're frivolous. They're too Disney. But I go back to it's just a new way of interpreting dark history. Not really new if you think about. Um, back in the day, Henry VIII created a reenactment of the Crusades on the River Thames. That was one of the very first battle reenactments that we had. So it is a long lineage of reenactment that we've had throughout history. So the arguments, again, um, they are actively involving more locals and descendants into the narrative development and how histories are being created. Um, they often try to be authentic and as historically accurate as possible, depending on what texts are there, also depending on what the experience is um, meant to be. Um, they're also recognizing that visitors understand um, the seriousness of the history, but in order to appreciate it, they do want to immerse themselves within it and experience it themselves. And then thinking about the future, so bringing it back to the creative industries, what we need the creative industries to help us out with is to merge into that digital technology. So if we think about places like um, at Disney California Adventure soaring around the world, could we see in the future using this type of technology to experience disasters? And so people can understand what a mudslide really would be like, or what a, a fire would really be like, or an avalanche. Um, we could have wearable technology so that you go around a space wearing some kind of headgear or gloves so that you can experience the dark history reenactment even more um, viscerally. And then also um, hotels. We're starting to see Star Wars uh, hotels where the audience members actually engage in their experience. It's not just going to a room and sleeping. Um, this is starting to creep into the dark tours and spec uh, spectrum because we have a lot of defunct penal institutions that are now being turned into hotels. So guests are now enacting kind of the prisoner lifestyle when they go to these uh, places of accommodation. So there's lots of different things that reenactment can use uh, the creative industries as they move forward into the future. Now, how does all of this tie into Oxford? What can we do in Oxford? So these are just a few histories that could be uh, used to create the reenactment of dark history. So we could have an AR or a VR experience of the riot of uh, St. Scholastica, um, which was where uh, a bunch of students uh, created a pub crawl and got into a fight with um, local townsfolk, three-day riot. Um, you could have a reenactment uh, tour or even a theater show of the curse of Roland Jenkins. We could have um, a reenactment experience of the highwaymen. The, uh, the York Dungeons does something similar to it, but you could, we could do it better. Um, and then you could also have kind of a co-created crime scene investigation of the still to this day unsolved murder of Kate Dungy. So there's lots of things that can be done with reenacting uh, Oxford's dark history. And I, I think I'm on time. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much, uh, Brianna. So um, I hope that uh, answers John's question about improving our um, tourism experience here in Oxford. Some, some great ideas there. So now we move to James Cateridge. He's a senior lecturer in film at Oxford Brookes University. And he's also the network lead for the Creative Industries research and innovation network. So his research on the creative industries has been used to inform many um, uh, sector uh, improvements. So he's here today to talk about a film. So I'll leave it to James. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> it's lovely to be back here talking to people in real life again. I think we've all had those moments where we've met people for the first time in real life. It's been, it's been a really interesting day so far. So. This is my talk, it's called Mapping Stories, and it's about screen tourism in Oxford, and this is the very handsome Sean Evans as um, Endeavour Morse in Endeavour, the recent remake, the reimagining uh, prequel of Inspector Morse. 
So when I uh, was starting to think about this talk, I wanted to go back and think about the projects I've done previously, but also kind of reconceptualize and bring everything together. So I thought an ideal way to do this, as I'm talking about mapping, would be through a sort of mind map. So I've designed this very, um, uh, with the help of Google, quite pretty mind map, which helps to bring together how I think about uh, film and TV tourism, screen tourism, uh, and then how it, how it links into issues around mapping or maps, physical maps, different kinds of maps. So my first sort of three branches here are these ones. Firstly, obviously, when we're talking about um, screen tourism, we have to think about place and place is different to sort of neutral idea of space. Place, places are meaningful to people because uh, actually often because there are stories attached to them. We don't, we don't really understand places until we can think about them in a narrative way. This is just a kind of human condition, but it's also something that happens with tourism and film and TV shows. Um, stories, in, the, in a lot of these cases, I'm talking about film and TV shows, but obviously these stories are often taken from books. I was talking to Julia before the talk today. There's so much crossover between um, heritage tourism, uh, literary tourism, and film and TV tourism, so much so that some uh, scholars and researchers are now calling them exactly the same thing because it's often very difficult to unpick them and separate them. That's certainly something I found in, in my own research, talking to, talking to actual tourists and, and, and reading around it as well. And thirdly, identity. I suppose this is the more abstract end of the spectrum, but I, I really believe that um, uh, film and TV tourists engage in this activity because it impacts on their identity, the way they think about themselves in some way, and also the identity of the place in which they're interacting. Building on from these little, um, I don't know what you call it, uh, initial ideas, uh, branching down this way, um, with place, obviously you have location, which is, this is all between story and place. Location is where elements of the story happen. Not the same thing as where things are set in terms of film and TV. As we know, often film and TV shows are, sh are shot in completely different places to where they're actually um, located in terms of the story. And one of the interesting um, ambiguities in film and TV tourism that is often found is that uh, visitors will tend to be attracted to locations from the story rather than actual sets. The classic example of this is um, Braveheart, which is obviously mainly located in Scotland in terms of the story, but often was, was shot all over the UK and, and shot in Northern Ireland and various different places. What's important to tourists is the story, the emotional sense of where the story actually happened in story terms. So the most obvious ver uh, version of mapping comes off this idea of set, set jetting, sometimes people call former TV tourism, where um, destination managers or local authority Tourist boards will create movie maps for a particular place to try and focus people's attention when they're here, maybe to try and bring new tourists to a place. These obviously used to be sort of physical um, leaflets that would be handed out in tourist, in tourist offices. Now that places like Oxford don't have a kind of tourist office, which is something I found out recently, they're obviously generally downloaded as PDFs or in digital form. Didn't stop my clock, so I'm, I'm gonna have to do that now. Um, building on the, the idea of story, we have genre, which is very important for film and TV shows. The, in, in, and in terms of Oxford, the key genres to think about are uh, fantasy, you've got Harry Potter, but also the kind of big budget blockbusters, which have been shot in and around the area. Most recently, the, the Wonka prequel to the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Uh, period dramas, obviously, that we have amazing locations and sets, but whether film and TV shows can get access to them is another issue with Oxford, as I know. And, and finally, crime and Inspector Morse. Um, franchise, I suppose, has been really important for film and TV tourism in Oxford for many years, as you'll see in a second. Um, I wanted to think about how this relates to mapping. So there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a discussion around the idea of cognitive mapping and how that relates to stories. So when we think about a place that we've never been to before, often we have a mental map of it. And this usually, often, well, quite often comes from a story. It can come from a film or a TV show. So we build a, a, an image in our heads of, of what a place is like based on stories, uh, novels, um, and films. And this is something that I do myself. I know when I'm going to a new place in the world, I will try and engage with, with, with films and TV shows set there. I'll try and read novels, which uh, uh, um, come out of that place to, to try and build this kind of cognitive map to prepare myself to visit a new place. On this side of the map, we have uh, performance, which comes in between identity and place. Um, as with the tourist experience, we know that locals or, or other people engaged in the tourist ministries are, in, are engaged in performing a place for the visitors. So it's not just, it's not a static process. You have to perform, you have to reimagine a place every time a visitor arrives. You have to retell the stories, you have to do the walking tours, you have to tell the stories again and again. And it's all about a process of performance and, and, and reenactment as we've already heard from Bianna. 
Uh, but, obviously, but also visitors are performing roles in some ways. We all know we behave differently when we're tourists. We take on different roles. We maybe kind of assume different national identities. When we go to Paris, we kind of sit in cafes and drink red wine and eat cheese in a very superficial sense. But I think in a deeper sense, we have this sort of cosmopolitan national identity, which comes from being tourists, from visiting different places, from understanding more about uh, local national cultures, international cultures. Down this side, photos are really important for the tourist experience. A lot of the research in um, tourism generally talks about the tourist gaze. So the idea that looking at things is, is, the, is the primary object of tourism. And in order to capture that moment, you have to take a photo and then you have to go on social media and you have to perform the photo and show it off to the people. And, and as I'll talk about in a second, I think we can think about the way that social media builds up, has built up tourist experience as, as a form of digital map and possibly a form of deep map, which is to do with identity. On the top side, um, building our, uh, between story and identity, we have character, fandom, stars. Stars are probably a bit less important for film and TV tourism uh, than characters. I would argue most people are, are attracted to Inspector Morse as a character rather than Sean Evans as the star, but you never know, there might be some people who are really in love with, with Sean. Um, and then more broadly, there's lots of elements of identity I could pick up on, but I think the, one of the most important ones in my research has been sort of dias diasporic, diasporic national identity, difficult to say. Um, so people who have a kind of um, affinity with a different national identity to the one in which they live. So a good example of this is uh, people from third, third, fourth generation Scottish immigrants in America and Canada who watch TV shows like Outlander, which is a, a fantasy series set in Scotland, and therefore feel the desire to travel back, not only to experience the story that they love, but also to find out more about their own diasporic national identity. Uh, and then the, uh, the most sort of abstract idea, sense of mapping I hear is deep mapping. This is an idea from, which comes from actually from literary theory, but it's been built on in the digital humanities. It's also really important for um, performance artists and artists in general. It's a very broad term. It doesn't really mean anything very concrete, but I, I think of it as, as, a, as a sense of places becoming sort of repositories for stories. So when you visit a place, you gain to engage with different stories, stories of the people that live there, stories of the people that visit there stories that were written there and it's all about layers and layers so you can kind of excavate you can dig down through these layers in a uh, as part of the process of being a tourist i've already probably used it most of my time there anyway um so yes just a, a brief example of the uh the sort of theory around film and tv tourism which is not too theoretical and also very useful in the real world i think this is why i picked it so stein Reinders is a researcher in the university of Rotting rotterdam in, in the netherlands and he has an idea called places of the imagination, where he talks about places as being space plus imagination. So not just stories, but imagination. You have to do the work. You have to be that person who thinks things through and, and processes stories. Uh, narrative and genre are very important. And detective dramas are a particular interest of, uh, of Stein Reinders. In, in fact, he traveled to Oxford to do the Inspector Morse tours to, to find out more about this from an, an Oxford point of view. Partly because if you think about how detective stories work, and this is something I want to come back to at the end, if I have time, um, detective dramas are often based around investigating space in a very similar way to tourists investigate space. So tourists might have an initial clue to go to a place. They might, they might have a pub to aim at or a, a an art gallery to aim at. But then when they're there, they'll find out new things and they'll be led around the space based on clues. And this is, if you think about it, that's quite similar to the, the plot of a traditional Inspector Morse episode or any of those kind of, Sunday night ITV dramas, which, which um, copy the same template. This is a, I, I love these little screen grabs from a very old, so over 30 years old Inspector Morse bus tour um, being guided around Oxford. And whether these people are actually acting like um, detectives, I'm not sure, but they're certainly being guided around by an expert, the lady with the microphone. And you can see this is activity that's been happening in this city for, for many, many years and is still going on. You, you can also tell that the, the demographic is very much uh, 60 plus, uh, very white, very middle class um, tourists. Um, so to think about mapping again, so digital deep mapping, this is an example I thought about from Flickr, which is kind of precursor to Instagram, um, still beloved by proper photographers, proper photographers prefer Flickr, I think it's uh, higher quality than, than Instagram. But one of the key elements of digital photos is obviously that they have geotagging information associated with them, so you can locate them on a map. So if you go on uh, a service like Flickr and search for Inspector Morse Oxford, you can, you can instantly build up this interesting little map of uh, places and little stories. You can, you can click on the, the photos and you'll get a description of what happened. 
And this, I think, is sort of akin to like a deep map of the city, but it's, it's user generated. It's not something that's been imposed from above. It's tourists coming here and building it up themselves. Obviously, there are similar things on Google, but I think Flickr does this better and more elegantly. So I prefer that as an image. Um, Instagram is, is hugely important for film and TV tourism, particularly for young people. Um, I'm sure most of you will probably recognize where this particularly young man is, is standing in, in Oxford. Actually, I, I should point out, I do have permission to use this photograph. I did contact this, this young man and ask him to use his photo in, in my published research. So this is not, uh, there are ethics around social media. You can't just take stuff. He, he does still own the image, and, but he's allowed me to use it. Um, so Instagram selfies, uh, there's a, a, a researcher called Robert Frosch who describes them as sort of see me showing you me. So it's not just look at me, it's look at me, I'm showing you me, because the photos are not just for private memory work, they're for public display, instant public display. Uh, and also there are comments on it, as I'll show you now. So this is, uh, this is how this, this young person framed this photograph. Any of you Harry Potter fans recognize where I'm at? You can probably tell instantly where, which part of the world he's from. Um, and they have this little conversation about uh, the location, although he did kind of give it away by hashtagging Harry Potter. Um, and, and then his friend's guess is at Hogwarts, and they have this little discussion about um, wreaking some havoc, which is odd because he's actually, a, I don't want to talk too much about this, this guy, but he's a, he's a Christian and a, and a medical student. But I guess this is how people discuss things on, on, on Instagram. Um, my point, my point about showing this is about uh, it's about the layers of experience, and I think if you if you if you go through Instagram, the thousands of little stories like this, thousands of pictures, uh, and these all build up together into a kind of uh, a lived experience of, of Oxford, which is filtered through through visitors. And I think people people in Oxford and, and more generally can be very snooty about visitors and the visitor experience. But I think if you go into Oxford on on a Saturday or Sunday on a busy weekend, those are the people experiencing the city, not the people that live here. The people that live here are sat in Headington in pubs and cafes like me. Um, these are the people that actually create the lived experience of being in Oxford, generally. Uh, just finally, some new possibilities, and I'm kind of slightly over time, so I apologise, but um, immersive events. This is from an example of a secret cinema event um, on the TV show Bridgerton, which, is, which was run uh, earlier this year. Secret cinema do these amazing, very large scale, very intricate um, re rebuilding worlds from films and TV shows. And you pay to go and watch the film, but you also pay to become part of the world. You have to assume an identity, often you have to dress up. Uh, and this is an example of, of a Bridgerton ball where people were obviously dressed up and, and went along to engage with their favorite TV show. I think, I think Netflix have shares in Secret Cinema because they're doing a lot of Netflix stuff now. But it's easy to imagine something like this happening, particularly at locations such as Blenheim Palace in Oxford, which have obviously have experience of running large events and have been used for film and, film and TV locations in the past. Nothing, nothing necessarily that would affect, that would attract the kind of cult audience that Secret Cinema needs, but I'm sure we could, we could think of other examples that would, would work really well there. Augmented reality, again, this is something that has come up a lot and that I, th I think really hasn't been cracked. I've, I've, I've done another search on it. Every time I search on it, it seems like someone's working on a new app but there are still no apps on the app store that, that actually do this. And I think a big problem with, with augmented reality apps, if you imagine something like that, having holding your phone up on the, on the bridge, on London Bridge and seeing a clip from 28 days later, there are nightmare uh, issues around copyright, I think. And this is probably the main thing that holds up things like augmented reality as being something that works uh, in, in a real sense. Something a lot more simple and, and easy to do, and this is where I have an, an idea of my own, which could, I think could work in Oxford, these QR codes, this example is from Rio de Janeiro. They have these beautiful mosaic QR codes. Which is a really clever way of using them. Um, but I have an idea for, for an Inspector Morse tour in Oxford where you have, you have a QR code on a lamppost. You would be directed to the first lamppost. And after that, you have to find your way around the city based on clues which would come up on your phone. Maybe there'd be clips from a TV show. You could reimagine a whole plot line of, of an episode and you could find your way around the city based on QR codes. But you have to do a bit of work yourself. You have to engage with it and interact. That's kind of one thinking about trying to make actually happen at some point. So if anyone wants to help me make that happen, I'm sure there are people in this room that could help me with that, then please uh, come and speak to me at lunch when I'm shoveling down sandwiches. Um, and that's all for me. Sorry I overran slightly, but that's all. Uh, some references. Thank you.
James, thank you so much. Um, for anyone who wants to pick up on some of these ideas, you better stick around for Torch's uh, panel, which is on storytelling and gamification. So if you want to pick up on what James just said, please stick around for that uh, presentation. Last uh, for this panel, we have Julia Rossetti. She's a lecturer in events uh, at OBU here, and she researches festivals and impacts on people. So today she's talking about festivals, places, and storytelling. We wanna uh, save some time. So I am um, gonna ask uh, those in the audience, if you wanna pick up with some of what the panel said today, if you can catch up with them during the lunch break. Julia. Yeah. Thank you, Nicole. Hello, everybody. My name is Julia. So <clears throat> my PhD and research background is on literary festivals. So I would like to discuss with you today something related to storytelling, places and literary festivals, um, also with links with, to Oxford. So storytelling, we know it's the act of telling a story, a narration of something, about something, about someone. So if you think about literary events and festivals, there are some questions that festival organizers and managers need to answer, such as how do we tell a story? So we know stories can be written, so books, uh, poems. Uh, uh, we can have spoken word stories. Uh, they can be visual, such as, for instance, images, videos. Uh, we were talking about drama also, uh, dramas as in terms of telling stories, or even with Brianna with perfumes, or even with food. So nowadays uh, we are looking also at multi-sensory experiences where we can mix different tastes, different senses to create stories. Um, other questions are, but why do we tell a story? And specifically, where we're talking about Vanessa, who? do we tell a story to? So who is our audience? What do they like? What are their interests? Or what do they dislike? So before answering these questions, so let's have a look, let's take a step back and have a look at what literary festivals and events are and their evolution. So just to give you an overview, so the word festival derives from, the, uh, comes from the Latin festum, it's a Latin word, it means party. So it, it's, a, it's a feast. It's a celebration. So it's a social gathering of people meeting in a certain location, so in a venue uh, at a particular time. So usually it's a couple of days, a weekend or up to a week, sometimes a little bit more than a week. And they talk and they listen, they discuss something about literature, okay? So about books, about authors, so uh, readers can actually see, meet, listen their favorite authors. But as you can see here, there are loads of different terms that have been used to describe literary festivals. So uh, writers' festivals, book festivals. So, so far, there's actually not a uniform agreement on what are the differences between these terms. So generally speaking, we say book festivals are much more about books selling books, uh, buying books, uh, why writers festivals are about writers, aspiring writers with writing workshops. It's not really like that. And we're going to see why also, especially uh, nowadays, literary festivals are kind of shaping their programs. So what we can actually say, the literature um, is uh, dividing them into international and peripheral. So international festivals are big scale festivals located in very big cities with international guest speakers. And so the economic actually impact is quite relevant. And in contrast, peripheral festivals are smaller in scale and they are located even in very, very small villages in the countryside. And we do have them in Oxford here. And so they feature not just not mainly international speakers or writers, but also local writers, local famous people. Um, and then the economic return and impact is a bit smaller. Um, and also just to give you an idea, so the first festival was in Greece in uh, 534 BC. And scholars say that um, literary festivals, so the current literary festivals, share some similarities with the literary salons of the 17th, 18th century. So literary salons were um, 
moments where well-educated middle-class people used to meet in private households or cafe shops and they were discussing ideas about arts and politics and those ideas then were meant to be published in um, political journals now as you can see there are similarities but literary festivals now are a, a bit different and they are changing as well so the the still the oldest still surviving literary festivals uh, uh, is the times cheltenham literary festivals um the first uh, the first year was 1949 and for us it's very important because it's, it's just here it's near very near to us and however it has been one of its kind for loads of time loads of years um, because the real expansion worldwide of literary festivals starting in the 80s so we can say that they are new but not that new kind of cultural consumption products uh, so today we have loads of different type of literary festivals and events worldwide and they've expanded their program so as you know they've been included more events for children so sometimes you can even see a program just for children and families uh, but during the evenings we might have theater shows art exhibitions uh, sometimes concerts so it's not just about literature anymore it's about art it's about culture and scholars have been described in this shift as an, a way to attract more tourists to expand their audience um, so we're talking about tourismification of these kind of festivals and they've been criticized or some scholars argue that it, there is kind of a decline of pure literature into products that are commercial products as anna also was saying so is it's not really just about writers, aspiring writers, passionate readers, avid readers that they want to discuss about literature, but it's also about, for instance, locals, families, but also family members or friends that are not really interested in literature, but they have to attend because of a family member. So again, let's think about what our audience really wants and likes so uh, a very quick look in oxfordshire so we are famous oxford is famous for past writers just to mention a few talking carols we know that this is really linked to tangible literary heritage so we have graves we have houses we have museums uh, so it's, it's a very rich context um, that is also related to literary tourism and what james was telling also before all this experiences these attractions are not just for tourists but they are for locals as well we have a lot of students international students uh, uh, throughout the years there are walking tours there's uh, the uncomfortable literary walking tour um, this is also linked to film induced and screen tourism so harry potter alice in wonderland narnia again but we do have also uh, a very rich context in terms of living writers that are very important for literary festivals so um, authors that have lived in oxford or they've written something some books about oxford uh, throughout the years again we have writing groups uh, writing retreats um, so all this is linked to literary festivals and other several events related to literature now we have five main literary festivals in oxford so oxford tame henley vintage and chip in norton but we also have loads of others small events relating to uh, storytelling or comics uh, for instance the phoenix of the story museums so the the panorama is really really rich and as you can see here we can actually see linkages and connections between heritage places film tourism for locals and tourists so i would like to conclude by focusing on four main points so literary festivals and events are not really only about literature um it's 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 much more than that it's about culture it's about sharing displaying and sharing culture they can really be linked to place and heritage tangible as well as intangible through also um 
featuring, for instance, local riders, um, or even with walking tours or bus tours uh, through the tangible heritage. Uh, what is really important, or has been really important and still is, is the physical dimension of the experience. So when you go to a festival, you see the author, you hear the odor, but maybe there you can shake their hands or you can have your book signed. So this is really important, the act of being there. I am going to be there. I will be there. But we don't have to forget the online storytelling. So we were mentioning QR codes, hashtags. We do have an hashtags for this event. What about Twitter? Instagram. So when we go to a festival, we take pictures. So we like other pictures, we share, we retweet. So these are narratives that are part of the festival experience for our attendees. Um, and this is also going to be expanded by the next panel with Torch as well. Um, that was me. So that closes our panel on storytelling, spaces, places, and the visitor economy. I'm not gonna take any questions because Helen has uh, asked me kindly if I could save us some time, give you all a break before Torch's wonderful uh, presentation on storytelling and gamification. It's an interactive session. I can't wait for it. So I invite you to catch up with our panelists during the break time if you wanted to explore more what they've talked about. So thank you for your attention and patience and enjoy your lunch break.